Hello, my name is Lynn Johnston. I did the comic strip for Better or for Worse, and this is my Mr. Media interview. That was wonderful. Well, I can't tell you that I have read Lynn Johnston's wonderful daily comic strip, For Better or For Worse, from the very beginning in 1979. I can't remember a time when the Patterson family was not a part of my own family. I was a college sophomore when Lynn started. I remember becoming immediately attached to John and Ellie's daily adventures, raising their children, Michael and Elizabeth, their dog, Farley, getting to know their extended family, such as when Grandpa Jim started dating again, and even the heartbreaking death of Farley. When Mimi and I got married, we often read the strip together in the morning or shared a favorite. When Charlie was born, I related to the Patterson kids in new ways. And when Charlie started reading at four, I introduced him to collections of For Better or For Worse, which he devoured over and over again. On any given day, For Better or For Worse could be funny, sweet, bittersweet, or hauntingly dramatic, just like life in my own family or yours. Perhaps nothing about the strip was more shocking than the day in 2008 that Lynn announced she would no longer be producing new strips, but would be re-releasing the original strip from day one with occasional fixes to continuity and timeliness. And we all asked ourselves, would that even work? Well, it has and it does, with the strip continuing to appear in an astonishing 2,000 newspapers in 23 countries around the world. Now, we are conducting this interview just days after learning of the sudden death of the former editor of Universal Press Syndicate, Lee Salem, who I believe was a friend of both of ours. And here is something that Lynn and I have in common. Salem acquired both For Better or For Worse and Mr. Media, which started life in 1994 as a weekly syndicated newspaper column. And let's just say that uh, For Better or For Worse had a long and, and much more successful run with it. But uh, Lynn Johnson, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, so nice to meet you. Uh, I've been a big admirer of your work for so long. And uh, boy, 40 years. Does that, does that blow your mind? Well, it does. In fact, it was my daughter. And uh, there's a wonderful gal that does our website. And they both reminded me. And I, I was surprised. Yeah, 40 years. Well, so many years have gone by. I don't even recognize my, my image in the mirror now. So. Oh. Well, uh, you look great. <laughs> so don't, don't sweat that. What uh, can you say? Yeah. <laughs> you originally signed, as I read, a contract for 20 years, right? I did. Right. That was in 1979, and I started to work with Lee right away, um, developing a strip, because uh, I really had not uh, come up with any characters that were consistent. And so um, uh, he helped me all the way through that first six months as we developed the, the strip. And fax machines had just really been perfected. Everybody had a fax machine. Very grateful for that. And living almost in an Arctic community at the time. So it was an interesting uh, job at home with a company in Kansas uh, hitting a worldwide market. Wow. And do, do I understand that he, I mean, he literally discovered you in the sense that he found your work and came to you and suggested something? or how? No, I had done three little books on uh, uh, pregnancy, childbirth, raising little kids, and they were uh, published by a Minneapolis company, and that publisher sent them to Universal Press. Oh, and it was Jim yeah. Andrews, actually, of Andrews McNeil, who yeah. thought maybe I would have potential. So uh, they um, asked me to produce 21 comic strips as quickly as possible, like three weeks worth. And uh, I think they wanted to just put the pressure on to see how quickly I could produce. I think they do that to just about everybody. And uh, they liked what I sent them, and they sent me a 20-year contract. And off I went uh, to meet everybody in Kansas and uh, couldn't believe uh, I would be fully employed as a, as a cartoonist, which uh, is a pretty rare gift. How, what were you thinking when you saw 20 years I was terrified. I did not. <laughs> I really did not want to sign the contract. I mean, you know, you, if you've got the gift, you can be funny once in a while, but every single day for 365 days and for 20 years. And so, and I also didn't have anybody to go over the contract with me. So I had to trust that that contract was in my 
best interest, and of course theirs, of course. Um, and I watched my right hand sign that contract. They left me alone at a big rosewood table with this 20-year contract, which I signed. But I was very lucky to work with a very good company. Mm. It was a great company to work with. Still is. And uh, uh, people in the industry know who was there. But I mean, at, I think at the time, uh, Gary Larson was still doing the far side, right? Sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, Gary Trudeau was doing Doonesbury. Yeah. And uh, Herm and Kathy and I mean what a great group of people and uh, we all got to know each other quite well in fact Kathy was uh, the first person I talked to Lee gave me her home phone number and she was gracious enough to have a nice long conversation and sort of tell me how she worked the way she managed I mean coming up with ideas is the one thing we all ask each other about I mean how do you do it where where do you do it Sparky Schultz used to sit and doodle on yellow legal pads, but I like to sit on a couch with a coffee and a <laughs> pad on my lap. And and Kathy said the thing that helped her the most was to write vignettes as if she was writing for a play, like a short uh, a short four panel play. And I found that worked the best for me. Hmm. And uh, you want to just make clear what Kathy we're talking about. Kathy Guyswhite uh, has done a, a strip called Kathy for many, many, many years. And she also suggested I not call the strip the Johnstons because she said I have really wondered if it was a good idea to call the strip Kathy because she was so closely uh, connected to it. And really, I mean, even if the characters look like you or your family, it's all it's all pretty well made up. And I think I read that uh, only Ellie... Right. Only Ellie's name is actually the real, real person that she's representing. Everyone else's name has been changed from the what you originally planned. Everybody is it has the second name, like my middle names, right? Husband, yeah, my husband's name was 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 John uh, Roderick, but but he went by the name Roderick, so we used the name John. My son was Aaron Michael. My daughter was Catherine Elizabeth. Everybody had the second name, but Ellie was such a I don't know. She was such a profound character, and I couldn't really, I, I, I couldn't really identify her one hundred percent with myself. But I wanted to think of her uh, with a certain affection that um, I don't know transcended reality. And I named her for a friend of mine who died when we were in elementary school. Oh. And Ellie Jansen died of a brain tumor and shocked everybody. Christmas time, we all came back from Christmas holidays and she was gone and the empty chair in the classroom and the empty place in the choir. I mean, it was just devastating. It was the first funeral I'd ever been to. And so um, when I called the character Ellie, it just seemed to work for me. And years later, I went to see her family and uh, her sister was thrilled. And she said, I've thought about watching my sister grow older and grow up in the paper. And she was very happy about it. What a remarkable way to memorialize someone who you, you know, you miss and you care about. And, yeah, you, you know, you, you think I, you think about the yeah. effect on yourself, but the, the, her own family and people who knew her probably very special to a lot yeah. of people. Well, I've come back to live in the same little community. I, well, it's a huge community now in North Vancouver, but um, our elementary school is walking distance up the hill. And uh, I can sit on the steps there and remember her and everybody else. It's uh, kind of a, a romantic thing to do. But uh, the older you get, the more this romance means to you, you know. Um, let me come back to you and Kathy Geiswhite for a second. Um, the the number of uh, female cartoonists has always been kind of small compared to the number of men who are doing it. Uh, was there anyone else in the uh, in the community at that time? I'm thinking this might have predated Hillary Price, for example. Yes, Hillary had not started yet. I met a lot of people who were in animation. Nancy Beeman, for example, and Bunny Host worked uh, on the um, on the Lockhorns with her husband Bill. And there were a lot of people who, would, who were in greeting cards and. Uh, uh, comic books, and there are a lot of other people, a lot, a lot of women that you don't see, uh, you know, they're not heralded, they're animators and illustrators, and uh, these are the people that welcomed me as the other women in the group, mm. and um, it was a warm welcome. I rather expected it would be phony and, and uh, welcome, we hope you fail, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. But even those, I mean, you never know what to expect, And but even those of us who did uh, strips that were family-related strips, we were all very, very close, very 
uh, admiring of each other and supportive of each other. And I remember one time when Ziggy, Tom Wilson, was very ill. He was in the hospital and couldn't produce Ziggy. That uh, Jim Unger and Jim Davis and I were visiting in, at Jim's place in Nassau. And uh, and we sat down to try to draw Ziggy and come up with gags for him. I mean, we love each other. We really do. And wow. it was terribly hard to draw this simple character. But we did come up with a few ideas and sent them off to, to Tom's son. And uh, we felt as though we had done something, but to lose one of us is uh, shocking. And uh, when any one of us gets sick or uh, you know has a family problem, we're all involved. Hmm. That's very nice. Yeah, Tom. Uh, Tom Jr. has been on the show with me a few years ago. A very nice man. Um, he is. And how? Uh, how? What about? Well, I was going to ask you. You're talking about uh, the, the the man who dominated the industry at the time. Did they, as you entered and and, and you know the strip took off, did they treat you with the the same respect that they treat each other? Um, oh yeah, I, everybody everybody my age was great, but there were a bunch of old farts who were just awful. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard these stories. Yes. <laughs> I don't mean about you, but I've heard them. Th their behavior is not always the best. <laughs> well, at one point, I was actually president of the Cartoonists Association, National Cartoonists uh, Society, and um, they would draw naked pictures of me as I'm trying to conduct <laughs> a meeting, right? But I drew a few naked pictures of my own and uh, got back at them. But, you know, it was hard. They kind of preferred that I would make them coffee and uh, serve them tea and, you know, not, not really run the meeting. But uh, the younger people, those people who were all came into it about the same time my age, were equal. Even Stephen, I mean, if you can do the job, you're you're part of the group. And I I saw very little, if any, discrimination mm. for anybody, whether you know what they did or what their background was, or it was a very much a family. Um. It, has it been long enough that you want to identify any of the old farts that we're talking about? I'm sure they've all passed. <laughs> I think I'll pass. Some of them are still alive. <laughs> okay, I, uh, folks, uh, send me an email. I can, I can, I can guess at who most of them are, having been around uh, cartoonists a lot over the years. I, I have a good, I have a good sense of it. Um, I want to talk. You to know, in the long run, sorry, in the yeah. long run, when it comes right down to it. We really like each other. We really care for each other. And I know that they like me. So it's water under the bridge. But at the time, if you're trying to conduct a meeting, put that pencil down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And, of course, you're cartoonist, so your sense of humor is always running as well. So probably and, sometimes and you don't know when they're serious and when they're kidding. Well, there's often a slicing, biting angle to humor, too, and... Sometimes you got to fight with that. Got it. Um, I wanted to. I wanted to come back to the subject of Lee Salem a little bit, if we could. Um, how uh, you know? What kind of influence was he in the early days? Uh, and at what point did he go from? If he if he if he mentored you at the beginning, at what point did he not have to do that anymore, or not need not get involved in the same way? Uh, he was always involved. That was the beauty of this relationship. Uh, when I started, uh, he gave me a lot of confidence. He was the one who, uh, again, helped me learn how to write dialogue, uh, read all of my uh, pencil roughs, um, started up with me uh, when we first got going in the September of, uh, I think it was, uh, 79. And... Um, he was, he was not only a great editor, but he was also a wonderful advocate. And um, I was one of the, I, as I found out later, a few people that was always on deadline. But I know that he could be pretty severe with some of the folks who were late. And in syndication, you really can't be late. They have a deadline, and they've got to get the coloring done, and the newspapers have to receive it on time. And if you're lazy <laughs> or, or, you know, if you let things slide, it's up to the editor to really, you know, come after you and tell you that you've got to be serious about your work. So he had that side to him. He also worked diligently with the company itself. And yet he was able to be a liaison between those of us who were the creators and the people who were marketing your work. And there were sometimes there were problems. And again, there was a 20 year contract. <laughs> After a few years, you look at that 20 year contract and you say, really, I can't change anything. I can't move anywhere. So, um, 
you know, there was political situations, but all the way through, he um, he managed everything with such a uh, such integrity and uh, such kindness and and strength. You know, I mean, Bill Watterson used to call him Mister Opaque. Hmm. Because he never let you know that he was on your side, but he never was 100% on the side of the company either. He really kept a lovely balance between us, and for that, all of us are more than grateful. Did uh, Was there any advice he gave you over the years, either about the strip or managing the cartoonist's life or managing the, the, the business side of, of, of having the cartoon? And <laughs> He did tell me to buy a new car. He was, he was driving, he used to pick me up at the airport whenever I went down to Kansas, and he was driving this old clunker of a car, and I remember him saying that he really hated to give it up because it was a great car, but he said, if you can get around to it, buy a new car. So <laughs> it wasn't long after that that Lee and Anita bought a new car. Interesting. No, he didn't, he did not, he, he did not advise as much as he, um, he reassured and he guided and he, I mean, he's only a year older than I am, so we were very much the same age, but yet I always thought of him as being my supervisor, right? Which, I don't know, that it was an honor, actually, to work with him. And I don't work well with people I don't respect, so I worked well with Lee. So it's interesting. Um, uh, one of my best friends and, and my uh, every other week lunch buddy is uh, Chuck Shepard, who did News of the Weird for... I love News of the Weird. Yep, same here. Love- and I think, I, think, I think we all miss Chuck writing it. Oh, uh, yeah. He was surprised. And you said that Lee was only a year older than you. He was surprised to learn last week that Lee was a year younger than him. He, he always th- thought of Lee as being much older than him. How could he not be? He was the guy who guided his career. And, you know, so, yeah, it's interesting how we, you know, I think it's probably the silver hair that he had for so long that gave us the impression that maybe he was older yeah. than he was. Yeah, that's true. Um did uh, uh, were there ever any editorial challenges uh, between you? For example, I mean, the, you know, the most heartbreaking lo- uh, storyline for me had always been the, the death of Farley. That was just so, you know, I, st- I still think of it, and I probably could bring a tear to my eye over that. Uh, but there, you know, there were other things over the years that were maybe a little controversial. Uh, the character coming out, um, would, but that you- was the one that Lee and I worked with. It worked together on uh, the most, hmm. and I I wanted to do the story because a friend of mine had been murdered. He was a comedy writer for the uh, uh, CBC in Toronto, Canada, and a great guy. I'd known him since you know junior high school, and we were great friends. And he and his partner used to do blackout comedy at Second City in Toronto and at Yuck Yucks, and he was just a great guy. And he he gave forty bucks to a street kid to go get some food and lodging for the night the kid uh, followed him home went and got a knife with the 40 bucks and uh slit his throat so uh, and the the media and the authorities at the time tended to say well there's another predator off the streets when it came to the death of michael and for whom the character in the strip that michael is named and my son and um i wanted to do a story for Michael Boncour. I wanted people to know that he was my friend, he was a neighbor, he was somebody's son. And so I talked to Lee quite a bit about this storyline. And I knew that it could only run four to six weeks because a serious story in a comic strip really doesn't work longer than that. You have to be careful because it is an entertainment medium. So you can't use it as a platform. So it had to be a a fairly concise but a, a realistic story. And he said, well, you might lose a few papers. And I said, how many do you think? And he said, well, six, eight. And I said, well, I think that's okay. I think if six or eight editors want to stop me, then it's worth it. Well, I lost about 45, 50 papers. Wow. Which was shocking. But at the same time, uh, once and most of the uh, markets had more than one major paper at the time, like Vancouver had the province and the sun and the Toronto had the star and uh, I can't remember what the other one was. But uh, 
it, you know, when one me, uh, paper would drop you, the other one would pick you up. Mm-hmm. So I actually gained papers through the storyline. But Lee and I were uh, worked together on this because the backlash was phenomenal. Like the phones rang from seven in the morning till 11 every night. And I answered everything. I didn't want to defer to the syndicate. I think a lot of uh, editors thought that I would just put everything through Lee and other people at Universal, but I wanted to confront everybody that wanted to talk to me. And what I discovered was that 90% of the editors were very open-minded, and the big newspapers were happy to run something controversial, but it was the small papers in the small towns where the editors would go to a coffee shop and be assaulted by his readers who didn't like the story. So those were the ones who were the most upset. And I remember one editor saying that his kids had been harassed at school and his dog had been spray-painted because he had run this story. Oh but it's probably the story I'm most proud of. Understandably, and at that time, it was still, it was still not something that was spoken about as widely. Now, it's it probably it probably wouldn't raise as many eyebrows to do it now, but at the time, I it think was very controversial. Surprised. I think you'd be surprised because the newspaper is still. I, I love the word bastion of uh, of uh, you know good clean humor because they want young people to come in and read the paper and the comics are the first page that the young people read. Kids, you know, I started reading when I was four and five. So they want it to be uh, really the entry level page for your next uh, generation of readers. And this story did not go down well with a lot of people who did not want to uh, and a lot of readers did not want to explain things to their kids. But on the other hand, oh, we got, I say, about 3,000 letters. This was before email. So wow. we get boxes and bags of letters. And um, I took them all to the sociology department. First of all, I answered everything that was not X-rated and ridiculous. And and you might get 30 letters from Dear Mr. Jackson we hate what you did on the Sunday page. And it would be some religious bunch who'd been told by their leader, well, we want you to send all these, you know, letters off. But they didn't know who I was or what I did. It was like, all right, sir, you said it, do it. (laughs) A little cattle call, we'll do it. And so people like that, I didn't bother to respond to. But so many letters came from family members who said, I talked to my daughter for the first time today, or a child who said, I came out to my dad, or people saying, um, you know, I, I haven't uh, been able to talk to my mother, and for the first time we talked, and it opened up a lot of uh opportunities for people because it ran for again four weeks so every day for four weeks people looked at it and and took this journey and realized it was the kid next door so of the 3,000 pay uh, letters that I got 70 percent were positive Hmm. I took them all to the sociology department at the university in North Bay and of course they love to analyze everything so they said 70 percent is positive and that 30 percent of the 30 percent very few people you could talk to on a comfortable conversational level they were just outraged beyond thought Hmm. which is limiting if you're a human you know you got to (laughs) think So it was a it was a it was a really uh, interesting story, and there were times when I wished that I hadn't done it because um, there were threats, you know, uh, people threaten you, your life and your family, and and um, fortunately I was living in a small town in northern Canada, and was not likely to be reached by some <laughs> bozo who'd want to come and throw something at my front door. So Canadians a little more tolerant than Americans in that way too. Well, in fact, we lost one Canadian paper. The Halifax Herald dropped me and never picked me up again. So I guess Halifax, surprisingly, the editor, I guess, was uh, most upset. Even after all these years, they never picked it back up? No, not even. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And and, and how did the reaction to that storyline compare to, well, the one I I mentioned earlier, uh, the, uh, the death of Farley, the dog? Well, one thing that you cannot ever... Uh, uh, guess is what the headline is going to be on the on the day that your strip starts to run. So I I did the story of Farley because he was an old dog and he had to go. And I thought it was a gentle, sweet story. It had some emotion to it. But Farley died on the day of the Oklahoma bombing. Oh, wow. So that headline 
was overwhelming for everyone. I think it was the first major terrorism act in in North America, and it was tragic. So people did not want to read about the death of a favorite dog on the day that they're reading about this horrific situation. So, uh, you know, and people were angry with me because they assumed that you send the art out on the day that it's published. They don't realize you send it out weeks in advance, six weeks dailies, eight weeks Sundays. And even with the new electronic uh, messaging systems, they still like to have it well in advance, mostly for the coloring and because you're sending stuff to Australia and, and, and Bangkok and they want to be able to edit it there. Wow. Yeah, yeah. just just to clarify, people, that was the uh, uh, federal uh, federal building in yes uh, in Oklahoma and it turned out that it was a, uh, an American who did it, Timothy – wow, I can't think of his last name, but – yeah. Uh, uh, home, Good. I'm glad you can't think of his last yeah, name. Yeah, we don't need to give him credit. Home, <laughs> home, homegrown terrorist. Uh, People was, should be forgotten. It was a horrible story. Yeah, that, that is bad timing. I did not realize that that was the day that it fell on. Wow. Yeah, and, and when um, Michael and Deanna got married, the wedding took place right as the Twin Towers were coming down. And I was talking to uh, one of the editors I worked with at United Media, and as I was talking to her, she was saying, there's paper blowing by the windows. The sky is gray. People are screaming. The cars are stopped in the streets. And I, I was listening to this as it was happening. Mm. It was really, and, and people were angry. Some people were angry that a wedding should take place on such an unhappy day. Other people were saying, thank you for making normal still there for us. We want to see normal at a time when nothing makes sense. I think that's very true for most people when it comes to uh, the, the TV shows, their comic strips. You need a place to go, uh, and these have been crazy times. So, yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the the creation process for the strip. Um, in general, um, which cartoons uh, have been funnier and more memorable for you over the year? Is it is it the idea that that came to you quickly? Uh, you know the one that you the one that you had to roll over in your mind over and over again uh, to get it right. It varies, you know. I remember Sparky being asked which one was his favorite strip, and he said he said if I had one favorite strip, I should quit now because I'm hoping always to write the one favorite strip, and I want to write thousands of them. So um, I think the the funniest comics are um, probably the Sundays because you have more time and more timing. To, to work out the imagery. And I love to draw, and I love funny drawings and expressions and body language. And the dog gave me so much to work with. It was great fun. And the little kids, too, when the kids were small. So, um, yeah, the Sundays, I think, were funny. But, you know, I did some horrific puns, groaners, just groaners. And uh, the, the strip is coming out now in a whole new series of books by IDW, and they're big, thick collection books. There'll be nine of them, and they're about to release the fourth now and I've been looking through those and laughing out loud I couldn't believe that I'd written something that was that bad or that goofy or you know and uh, and uh, and and the, the strips that are in this bigger book I just want to say that I think there's a size laugh ratio the more they shrink down your work in the newspaper the less funny and significant that it is and, you know, if you go to a, a National Cartoonist Society Rubin Awards weekend, I'm sure you've been there, and they'll show artwork that's the size of the room and these massive screens. And this will be a New Yorker cartoon or a, a greeting card that's up for an award or something. And you just laugh out loud because the size, you know, goes into your eyeballs and whacks you on the back of the head and rolls around and hits your heart and you laugh out loud. But these tiny little postage stamp things, you know, you look in the paper and you say, well, that's funny. Or, or, you know, that's worth cutting out maybe, but you don't because it's so insignificant and small. So they're, if they want to encourage young readers, they're going to have to produce something that goes through the eyeballs and hits you on the back of the head, rolls around and comes out there. <laughs> well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the uh, IDW collection. They and, uh, 
a fan of graphics, which has been reproducing this, the Peanuts book, uh, strips. Yeah. They do very nice work. They, Beautiful. Work. Yeah. And it, it's a real honor. I mean, when people treat your work better than you do, much better. I mean, I'm more likely to throw it in a drawer and forget about it. But when someone takes it and analyzes it and, you know, archives it and cares about it, wow. And IDW has been just fantastic. And uh, are you more proud of your writing over the years or your cartooning? Can you separate the two in your mind? Well, they both went together. If you don't have the writing, you don't have the art. Mm. And I'm proud of what I did. I really am. It was a really hard job. And my competition was with myself. I always wanted to improve and get better. Um, I think I worked for Charles Schultz as my mentor. I wanted, I, I used to send the work to the syndicate thinking, oh, I hope Sparky likes this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nice to work for someone else that you admire. So not only was I hoping to impress Lee and the other editors at the syndicate, but I was also hoping to, you know, have Sparky's approval. And, you know, all of us, um, we all know each other in this industry and uh, we all have a different penmanship and we all have a different style, but we all analyze each other's work and knowing each other's families, you, you know, there's a, it, there's a depth to it that goes more than just simply illustration and writing. So I kept my relationships strong and I kept my work on time. And I, I think in terms of ethics and a good employee, I did a great job. I'm very proud of that. And I maintained this thing for for uh, th almost 30 years. And I ended it because it was time. You know, like a good novel should end somewhere. It should end when people say, oh, don't stop now. That's when it should end. It's when you know you've done a good job and that if you keep on going, it's not going to be as good. It's going to go downhill. That was my fear. Well, the, the of course, the argument there is that yours was one of the rare strips where the characters aged things happened. They didn't stay, you know, Charlie right. Brown stayed the same age his entire run of however many years that was, 30, 40, 100 years. Um, but, uh, you know, we see, we see uh, Michael and, uh, and Elizabeth growing up. We, Michael gets married. We see, we see the parents, you know, they're aging. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we, Grandpa Jim, you know, he, he loses his wife eventually, you know. And um, so the, the argument could be made uh, that you could have continued this family saga forever, but, uh, but yeah. But I lost my edge. Really? My edge was the elastic beauty of those fast drawings that I did when I started. By the time I was almost 30 years in, I was trying to make every day better than the day before. So I'm putting every leaf on the tree and every line on the highway and trying to make the cars look realistic. And, and I was overdoing everything I hired another artist to work with me and I would do everything in pencil just ink the characters and she would do all the backgrounds and the lettering and with that kind of professional help I could be even more intricate and you know she used to hate it if I did a pharmacy or a grocery store because I put every can on the shelf and label them all and you know I did every little a uh, sock on the counter in a, you know, uh, in a clothing store. I mean, I got so detailed and my characters uh, became more detailed because I had to change them. You have to, you know, you have to make them look a little different as they grow up. Mm -hmm. And so they became more and more mature looking and the more mature looking and, and exact their body is, you know, skeletal framework the less stretchy and elastic and goofy they can be. And then when Michael's children were born, they had to look totally different from Michael and Elizabeth as children. So I gave them lips. Well, when you give a kid <laughs> lips, you give any character lips, like like Michael's uh, wife, Deanna. I mean, she had these lovely little rosebud lips. Once you do that, you can't stretch it. You can't yeah. turn it into, you know, the only character that was left for me to have fun with was the dog. And by then Farley had died. Mm. So I had perfected myself out of a job. And um, there were too many characters, mothers and fathers and neighbors and teachers and school bus drivers and on and on. The kids and on. had their friends. Yeah. Kids had their friends. And I think uh, Stephanie, who is my archivist, said, you know, you have well over 90 characters mm -hmm. with names and personalities in that strip. 90. That includes, you know, postmen and school bus drivers, things like that, that were just sort of vignettes, you know, walk-ons. But 
Yeah, it was too complicated. So right, probably the third year that I was working, I had my sea legs and I was on a roll. So I guess the middle 10, 12 years in there were the best in terms of art and comedy. Yeah. And then it became just too much of a, a slick storytelling. I found uh, a copy of uh, With This Ring on my bookshelf last night, and I was looking at the cover, and the first thing that struck me was that uh, in that image, uh, I, I could see a lot of Michael, the son. Uh, well, I could see a lot of John, the dad, in Michael, the son, oh. I, I thought. But the other thing that struck me was uh, by the time that you were dealing with uh, Michael being old enough to marry and marry Deanne, um, it was almost photorealistic. The, the 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 detail had changed. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you were saying. I think because the, the, they were so detailed, um, and 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 their expressions were so precise. It was uh, very different from five or six years earlier. Really, it yeah. was really different. I used a Polaroid camera all the time. I have no. I have albums full of photographs that nobody, unless they knew what I did for a living, would understand why these odd photographs were there. Like, for example, people holding hands. How does that really look? And how does it look when a kid is holding their hair up and cutting it with a pair of scissors? I mean, where exactly? If you're trying to screw in a handle of a drawer and you've got the screwdriver on the inside of the drawer and you're holding the handle, how? where do you put your hands there? There's so many tiny little images that I wanted to be right and if it's not right it doesn't work Mm -hmm. and whenever I'm doing a workshop or something I call these things like a log on the highway you want your audience to drive down that highway without hitting anything that's going to take them away from the punchline at the end and my uh, my example is I remember a woman had done a cartoon about a lumberjack who was using a chainsaw now I can't remember what the joke was about because the chainsaw was so badly drawn that that's all I saw was this horrible piece of work that all you need to do is pick up a catalog or go into the garage, find a chainsaw, you twit. Draw it, draw it to make it look like a chainsaw, and then your reader won't say, what the hell is that, an alligator and a stick? What? And so uh, whenever I'm working with students, you know, and I'll say, you know, get photographs, do the work, do your homework, do the research. One of the things that I find is really helpful is toys. And right now you can get the most fabulous realistic toys, like all of these matchbox cars and the ones that are um, uh, the, the metal, die cast metal that the doors open and they have the little windows inside the steering wheels and everything. I mean, you can hold that car up at any different angle and that gives you the car going down the street. I have school buses. If you try to draw a school bus, I mean, you're not going to find a photograph online or in a magazine. You're, you're going to have to go outside somewhere and, and take a photograph. But you can buy a school bus. So then you can turn it three quarters, and as you turn it, it's only going to take up one panel of a comic strip rather than the whole darn thing. Mm. So um, you can buy all kinds of of really neat miniatures, bicycles and tricycles and soccer balls. What does a soccer ball, what does a basketball really look like? Those lines on the basketball, is there like a peanut that's wrapped around the ball? (laughs) Can you draw that without any uh, material in front of you there? Probably not. So I have a basket full of toys, and kids will come in and go, "Wow, I got to play with this stuff." You say, "Wait a minute, <laughs> those, are, so those, got, those are my artist models, <laughs> right?" I've got rollerblades and and skateboards and all kinds of great stuff: a jukebox and an ironing board and a stove and a kitchen sink. I mean, all in this box. So go out and buy toys, folks. Wow, good advice, young cartoonist, right there. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, I, I, several years ago, uh, Brian Walker was on the show, uh, Mort Walker's son, and um, he was talking about two of his books at the time. One is the comics, which was a history, but he also did a book, uh, kind of the art of uh, Gary, Gary Trudeau. And Gary went through, uh, I think, uh, this was something we talked about, something similar in terms of the evolution of the art in his trip. Uh, when when, uh, when uh, Doonesbury started, it was always funny, it was always clever, but the art was nothing... Sorry, Mr. Trudeau, but I think uh, no surprise here. The art was not something to write home about. But over the years, he didn't get as close to the photorealism that I think you you did. But his art 
changed dramatically. It became, you know, he really focused on on uh, the detail, and we could see the characters so much more clearly. I was curious. Well, he, what I did, he hired another artist, a oh. really artist, and I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you the name of his artist, but the two of them have worked together for many, many years, and so they're, you know, they're just a tight team, and so because he has worked with the other artists, has given him wonderful freedom to be, I mean, the astute writer that he is, I mean, he's a real political savvy guy, you, you don't want to touch that material unless right. you know what you're talking about and are willing to, you know, deal with the, whatever the repercussions are, I don't have the thick skin, I had tremendous admiration for Gary, and, and once he he was able to work with another artist, then that gave him tremendous freedom, and the other artist just sees through his eyes. It's a great partnership. Hmm. And what uh, what cartoonists, either uh, contemporaries or back before you started, uh, were there any that, that particularly influenced you? That uh, you know, whose work you you would maybe go back to, or just sure? Oh yeah, uh, Len Norris. I copied his work. He was a political cartoonist for the Vancouver Sun, and my dad collected his work. And when his books came out, my dad had them all. And my dad took me to meet him once as he was doing a, a, a show, actually, at Eaton's in downtown Vancouver. And I admired him so much. And what I loved about his work, aside from the fact that he was very funny in terms of his wit, but he always gave the reader something extra. If he was drawing a Victorian living room, there'd be a bird cage, a Victorian bird cage, but you just see the feet of the bird at the bottom. The bird is dead, obviously, but the gag is somewhere else on the page. But as the reader, you'd look all around his drawing to see all these little extra goodies that he gave you. If there was a picture off kilter on the wall of a ship at sea, then the horizon was still level, even though the, the picture was at an angle. I've seen other gags that way. I think even Disney has done this, but Len mm -hmm. Norris was first. And uh, Doug Wright was another Canadian cartoonist who uh, did a regular feature in the Saturday. Um, there was a, a, a newspaper magazine that would come out at the Post Weekly, I think it was called. And he did a strip called Nipper, which had no words at all. What a talent. For many, many years, Doug Wright did this fabulous um, comic strip called Nipper, and uh, I'm sure it, could, it should have been syndicated worldwide because there were no words you could have sent it to any country, but it was about a family and mostly about this little boy and his dad and genius, wonderful work. And then Mad Magazine, of course, which my mother wouldn't allow me to have, so I would rip the middle out of an Archie and stick in the mat. Right? <laughs> yeah, you could get you could get uh, four Archies for one man, and I loved Archie because as a teenager, you know, you really get into all that stuff. And uh, yeah, Mad Magazine. My gosh, Mort Drucker and Sergio and all these people, and I got to meet them. Mm. Shockingly, oh. years later. I mean, people that I admire. You, it, it, when you admire someone, you very rarely expect to to meet them, much less borrow their car and go have a beer. You know, <laughs> we just... we are actually recording this on Sergio's birthday. Oh, really? Yep. Happy birthday, Sergio! There you go. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's been on he's been on the show and. Uh, He's a good guy. I always enjoy so talking to him. Um, yeah. Well loved. Let's change gears a little bit and talk about uh, the comic strips and the newspaper industry, if we could. Um, comic strips are entering a pretty tough period of survival with uh, shrinking newspaper space, uh, newspaper consolidation, and papers just shutting down their presses entirely. How does that make you feel after all these years? Of, uh, you have a connection uh, – to that industry. How do you feel when you see this happening? I'm questioning. I'm wondering where all of this talent is going to go, where it's going to be seen. Um, things change and you can't stop them from changing. I'm sorry that newspapers are going, but even now when I, I get a regular newspaper, it comes once a week and there's so much paper, I don't know what to do with it. And so I can see why we're going to other media and it's certainly, I mean, I can sit and read everything on my phone in the morning. I don't need a newspaper, but there's no space for comics necessarily on my phone. So I don't know where we're going. I think graphic novels are fabulous. I, I am so impressed by the graphic novelists that I know and the work that's coming out, but not everybody, you know, can do a graphic novel. Not everybody has the discipline. And one of the things that a 20-year contract with the syndicate will give you is discipline. You have to get that out there no matter what. But if you're 
working on something that doesn't have to be to a publisher for a year. You, you really have to be self-motivated. You have to push yourself hard. And that takes confidence and it takes um, subject matter, right? You, you know, where do you go? Where do you go for a full-time job as a cartoonist now? I don't know. I'm going to be going to Washington, D.C. next week. Um, the Canadian Embassy is doing a show of my work, which is a wonderful honor. And they've asked me to speak to the uh, graphic art department of the university there. And I have no idea what to say to these people. So I'm what, I, I want them to talk to me. I want them to tell me, where do we go from here? As, as artists, as graphic illustrators, where, where are we going? And it can't all be animation and television and video. It has to be something that's hard copy. Where are we going? And I, I need them. They, they're not going to learn much from me. Well, uh, if, if if you can imagine right now that you have an audience of uh, editors and publishers uh, from around the North America and maybe around the world, and you could look at them, and what would you want to tell them about the value of continuing to keep comics in their papers and not to not to shave the comics off as a, a way to save a few bucks? I can't tell them because they have to save a few bucks. They have to. They have no choice. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they, it's mean spiritedness that's made them shrink everything down. It's necessity, right? And, and that's the reality of today. Um, I think, I think right now we're going through a bit of a revolution and people realize that a laptop and a, and a iPad are not the only way to get your information. And I think a lot of books are coming out again. I think paper is going to be, there for us always but i don't think the bookstores are going to close just like the microwave didn't kill the conventional oven right uh and radio uh was not affected much by television we're going to be working in tandem with the paper products and and with publications um again i'm going to go to those university students and say where are we going from here and i have every sympathy for the editors of magazines and newspapers you know the paper stuff that uh, you know you do a subscription to um i don't know where they're going either and i think it's it's going to be another 10 15 years of just sheer experiment well as we uh as we kind of wind down and you've been great and very patient with a lot of questions probably more than you're expecting great questions thank you yeah. um I guess one of the questions that I, I have and that people I've, I've talked to about you uh, leading up to today want to know is what have you been doing if you haven't been doing the strip all these years? Well, I have been doing fabric designs, surface designs, uh, like endless, uh, seamless patterns for uh, anything from jacket linings to bedspreads to shower curtains to wallpaper to whatever. And we're only just starting to market them now. They're just happening now. Some of them we've sent to a great company called Spoonflower, which will is a print-on-demand company, and you can research their archive. And if you're looking for uh, puppies, or you're looking, and and you know you can, they will show you all kinds of uh, art, and you can choose what you want, and they'll send you you know printed fabric and how many yards that you need. But uh, we're only just starting to market it now. We've uh, just signed uh, with a marketing company actually in Virginia. Hmm. How did you uh, fall into this? This is very far afield. Uh, and, and are they marketing, uh, as they market these, uh, is your name attached? Would people be able to find your work that way? I would suspect that will be part of it, but I don't want for better or for worse to be a big deal in this. I want this to be sort of, you know, a new, a new project on its own. Um, the fact that I can hit a deadline is a good thing. You know? <laughs> sure. But... Um, yeah, so far we we really haven't got it off the ground, but the way it got started was that I was, you know, this is like tooting my own, own horn here, but I got a star on the Walk of Fame in Toronto, and I was going to be on the stage with Mike Myers and uh, Shania Twain and Andrea Martin and other people, and I thought, what do you wear? And as a cartoonist, I wanted to wear something funny, and I had a friend who was a designer for Vogue, actually, wow. and she said, you find the fabric, I'll make you any dress you want, you just, we'll design it, it'll be a great fun dress you find the fabric I couldn't find any fabric that was funny or whimsical or it was you know I couldn't find anything so I thought well I better 
try and create something. And one day I was walking past a wedding dress shop and there in the window was a perfect wedding dress. So I bought this wedding dress, which had a big uh, flat white skirt and I drew cartoons all over the skirt and colored the cartoons. And that dress was a hit. I mean, people kept coming up to me that night saying, where did you get that crazy dress? And I've worn it quite a few times and it's a real showstopper. So my daughter looked at the dress uh, about three years ago and said, you know, this squeezy paint you got from Walmart is not going to hold up forever on this dress. So let's digitize it and turn it into a pattern. So she did that. And it was a great pattern. We had a scarf made out of it. And it was great. So we thought, maybe this is something we can do. So I'm hoping that there'll be some other folks out there who are looking for funny fabrics that are not just funny, but pretty too. Like it looks like paisley from a distance, but when you look at it close, it's funny cats, funny dogs, fish, uh, zoo animals, um, whatever, but they're funny. And they're, it's uh, lighthearted, but, um, but uh, kind of sophisticated as well. So we're hoping somebody will take an interest in it. Interesting. Interesting. And then, um, uh, my friend Howard Finberg, who's news, an old newspaper guy from way back, uh, was curious about when the uh, when the current rerun of uh, For Better or For Worse reaches the conclusion, will it start over? What 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 have you you know what have you set set down for this? Uh, no no idea. You know, when it's when it ends again, there will certainly be some wonderful books out there that if people want to look at the books, the books will be there. But, you know, there's room for someone new. I can't hang on to this piece of real estate forever. I mean, I want to see someone new come in and just knock the socks off me. <laughs> and uh, I would love to hire that person right now if I could. But uh, it's uh, it's been a wonderful run. I can't uh, I can't begin to tell you how honored and uh and uh, I don't know, fulfilled I am because as an artist, you want to have some kind of body of work and legacy, you know, something for your kids to criticize. And <laughs> 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 what are we going to do with all this paper? <laughs> oh my God! Well, so, the, uh, yeah. when does the when will the current run? When does it reach its conclusion again? Well, it's about halfway there, I think. Maybe no, no. Maybe it's only a third. I haven't. I haven't paid any attention to it. Two thousand eight. So the original strip ran for thirty years, approximately. Twenty-nine. I tried to make it to thirty, but it just didn't happen. Okay. So part okay. of the problem too was that my marriage dissolved, and you're trying to write about a happy working family when really life is upside down. So for that reason too, I really needed to separate myself from it. I see. I see. And so, uh, when it, so okay. So it's been ten years since you ended because you ended in two thousand eight. This is uh, two thousand nineteen. Uh, so it's about eleven years. It's got plenty of time to run. Yeah, so, it'll run for a while longer. I am very, very lucky. Okay. So you really didn't. You know, you may never have to deal with the issue of, but you don't expect it to to start over again a third time. I'm guessing. No. And you and. No. And you surprised me by saying that you actually want to see it. Uh, you want to see someone else step into that. Of course. That's great. What a joy. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not the only one. There are other people with these same twisted genes that I have. So where are you? Where are you? Nice. And I would be glad to open the doors for anybody who uh, who had that uh, uh, skill, you know. Sometimes you don't know you haven't until you're challenged to work and uh, mm -hmm. that was that was me I, I had a certain amount of chutzpah at the beginning thinking I could be funny and send stuff to the paper but uh, that 20-year contract and Lee Salem along with it to help me through that I hope the next generation has that kind of wonderful opportunity that I had well folks uh, listen you can uh, read the continuing daily adventures of Lynn Johnson's cartoon family the Pattersons in her long running strip for better or for worse, in your local newspaper. You can also now buy the first four of nine collections from IDW Publishing. They do a beautiful job of reprinting things like this. Uh, there is also the website for the strip, which is uh, FBORFW, for better or for worse, uh, dot com. Uh, do you uh, do any social media? Are you on Twitter or Facebook? Can people find no. you? 
No, I don't. I'm I'm one of these people that answers every letter and re- replies to every phone call. And I would just I just can't do more than I'm doing. I've got lots going as it is. I'm every day I have lots of mail. So just on hot mail. So probably probably a good decision on your part. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Lynn Johnston, uh, this has been delightful, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure, Bob.